These beautiful children are the children of my children. They're safe, they're free, they are spirited and they're happy. They have one thing in common with the rest of their generation. That in the year 2100, they will all be in their 80s. By that time, all of you will be well past that point. But there's one thing or a couple of things that scare me about that. And that is what kind of world are we leaving behind for this generation? My generation is what I call the locust generation because we've consumed almost everything in front of us. And what have we left behind for this generation? And let me share with you a photograph that I took only a week ago in a place that shall remain nameless. Not that long ago, probably 20 or 30 years ago, that piece of land was productive. It is now desertified with salt. And in Australia today, there's an area the size of a football field disappears under salt every hour. And we're degrading the planet at that sort of rate, and it's not just an Australian disease. And so, what is it that might reverse that? And what is it that history might be able to teach us? And what I've done is I've taken the, the history of the world, or most of it, 550 million years of it. Now, I don't know how good your brain is, but mine can't handle 550 million years. So I've said, well, what happens if one year equals one second? And we condense world history down on that basis. And we end up with a world history that is 17 and a half years old. And back there, five and a half, 550 million years ago, the first thing that started out was uh, crustaceans, shelled animals. At that point, the atmospheric CO2 was 7,000 parts per million. By taking carbon out of the atmosphere, those organisms lowered, over the next 175 million years, lowered atmospheric CO2 to about 4,000 parts per million, 10 times greater than it is today. Then along came rooted plants and plants with leaves. And Mother Nature invented 380 million years ago photosynthesis. And as photosynthesis took off, we lowered the CO2 from 4,000 parts per million to 500 parts per million, which back then would have almost made the Earth a place we could live in. During that phase where we took all of that CO2 out of the atmosphere, it had to go somewhere, and it went into vegetation. That vegetation eventually formed what we use today as fossil fuel energy. Then about 30, 40, 50 million years after that, along came organisms that had the ability to break down lignin. Now, if those organisms had arrived on Earth before coal seam and coal were actually formed, we would have no coal. So then what happened is that CO2 went up again because those organisms started releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. And then five years ago on my time frame, uh, plants, flowering plants arrived on Earth. And then the rate of use of CO2 from the atmosphere started to accelerate again. And then we got some grazing animals and man appeared. And if we look at how long man has actually been in the system, it's one and a half days out of 17 and a half years. We're new kids on the block. Mother Nature and Earth has survived quite well without us for a very, very long time, and she does not need us. So how can this 375 million year old technology help us with some of the issues we face on Earth today? What Mother Nature created is a thing called the carbon cycle or the life cycle. And that's the process of birth, growth, reproduction, death and decay. Every living thing is created from that carbon cycle. 
And during the process of birth, growth and reproduction, photosynthesis drives carbon out of the atmosphere and into every living thing. But that has to be balanced. And on the other side of the equation, we have oxidation, where Mother Nature also has a lot of tools that release that carbon back to the atmosphere again. And so we have carbon going around and around in a circle. Sequestration is leaving something behind each time we go around that particular cycle. And if we look at how much carbon there is, in that cycle on an annual basis, there's 150 gigatons of carbon cycle through nature's natural systems on an annual basis. There's about 800 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. There's 610 gigatons of carbon in all the vegetation on Earth. And there's 1,580 gigatons of carbon in the top metre of soil. So if you add up the carbon in the atmosphere and the carbon in all the vegetation on Earth, it does not equal the amount of carbon in the top metre of soils. Now it's estimated that as people, we emit about 10 gigatons of carbon a year from burning basically fossil fuels and the manufacture of cement. So to me, it's a fairly easy ask to take 10 gigatons of carbon and put it away in a 1,580 gigaton storage every year. And I remember uh, as a kid there was, a, there was a, a radio program called The Goons. And there was a character in The Goons who was an old farmer from somewhere in the West Country in England. And his answer to every question was, well, I think the answer lies in the soil. <laughs> and I think the answer lies in the soil. But how do we get carbon into the soil? Now we're all well aware of a thing called decomposition. So as plants decompose, they come, move from being organic matter into organic carbon. And it's the biology in the soil that actually does that. But that's only part of the story. The most important part of the story, driven by photosynthesis, is what's called the liquid carbon pathway. And that is that when a plant photosynthesizes, it takes carbon out of the atmosphere and creates sugar. And it takes about 40 to 50% of that sugar every day and puts it down through the roots and out into the soil. And its purpose in doing that is to feed the soil microorganisms. And if we were to take a teaspoon of healthy soil, we could find around about a billion microorganisms in that soil. But we have agricultural systems around the world where we're basically forced to overuse our environments. And the reason for that is that the true cost of producing food is not paid for. Australia is a great example. The Australian population has never starved and therefore we don't value food for its real cost. Somewhere along the line, farmers have to be compensated to stop them having to mine these resources which cannot be mined forever. And so what do we actually need? What do my grandchildren need to be healthy, safe and secure in the future? They need biodiversity in their ecosystems. They need healthy soils. They need healthy plants which will produce healthy animals, which will produce healthy food, which will produce healthy people. Every one of us is linked right back to the soil health that we all depend on. I look at an ecosystem is, as a pie. At the centre of that pie is carbon and we have ecosystem services and around the edge of that pie we have another, a number of other elements. And for the last couple of hundred years at least, and, and I would say for probably the 8,000 years that agriculture has been going, we have been shrinking the size of that ecological pie. Every part of that pie is interlinked. But if we can shrink it through mismanagement and lack of knowledge, it makes sense to me that with knowledge and good management, we can actually expand that pie. We can add more carbon into our systems. We can have more ecosystem services, better water cycle, 
better mineral cycle, better soil health, biodiversity, energy flow, which is how well we utilise sunlight energy. We can expand that entire system. And in the grazing industry, you might look at that fence there and say, well, one guy there had a lot of rain and the other guy didn't get it. <laughs> uh, the difference is two different guys. One knows how to manage land and the other one knows how to abuse it. And unfortunately, it's basically the way the world operates. But when we know how to manage it, we actually start to spiral that ecosystem up. We build the size of that pie because everything in that pie is interrelated. And when we change one, we change everything else. And as it goes up, but the guy on the right, his neighbour, is on a spiral dive down. That ecosystem is getting less and less productive every year, requires more and more inputs. It'll make less and less money for that farmer. And yet you wonder, he looks over the fence, and why doesn't he develop an ecosystem that can spiral up? I wonder that too. And we can also do it in farming systems. And there's new approaches using biology that, is, that are created through particular composting techniques that we can add to crops as they're planted. Now, the outstanding thing about that there, if you don't really know much about root systems, is that you can see a very small plant there and a very large root system. That root system is being protected by the biology that was put there with that seed. That plant was another photograph I took about two weeks ago in drought. That particular crop had received 10 mils of rain and nothing for five weeks. And that the little seedling there is not even wilting. And that's because Mother Nature and those organisms are actually protecting it and looking after it and getting it ready for when it does rain. And that's the same property, a previous crop on that piece of land, without chemicals and fertilisers and the inputs that we take for granted are needed in cropping systems. We can change what we're doing. There are some outcomes that I think we need. And these are outcomes that I would ask for. <clears throat> Firstly, we need to understand that farming practices worldwide can take carbon out of the atmosphere, can improve soils. In other words, we really just have to change the way in which we're doing it. But the farmers who are doing that and are prepared to do that need to be rewarded. In farming, there's a thing called the valley of death in that we have a conventional farming system here and we have a beautiful ecological system over here. But to get from a system that I class as being run on heroin to a system that's run biologically, you often have to go through the valley of death. And that valley of death is an economic one. Farmers need help and encouragement to take on that valley of death. And therefore we need to understand as consumers that we need to be prepared either to pay more for food or to support eco-credits or carbon credits that go to farmers that do the right thing by our national asset, which is our ecosystem. And if we do that, it's a win, 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 win in every direction. It's a win for the terrestrial ecosystem in this country and any other country that does it because we're adding carbon to the soil, which increases the water holding capacity. There's a win for you as consumers because that gives you food security, which is currently under threat. It gives you water security, which is currently under threat. And those are two of the biggest things that give me fear about the future for my grandchildren. It's a win for the atmosphere because we're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and we're able to influence the change that's already happening in our climate. And it's a win for consumers because you'll end up getting better quality food. There is absolutely nothing about this that doesn't work for every person in society. And all I ask is that for this generation of these beautiful little people, that every one of us take responsibility and do something to help change the environment 
and the attitudes in which we live. If we can just change some policy, if we can change the way in which we're prepared to spend our dollar, then we can help secure the future for this generation.